Greetings ladies and gentlemen and welcome to my Total War Warhammer 2 Regional Occupation video. In this video we'll look at how regional occupation in Total War Warhammer 2 or the first expansion of Total War Warhammer, whichever you prefer to call it, is likely to change, why it existed in its form as it did in Total War Warhammer 1, and the main driving forces behind the necessity for a change and why it looks like it's going to change as well as, well as speculating what form that change may take and how, will, uh, how it will affect the different races in the upcoming expansion to Total War Warhammer. Those of you who don't know, regional occupation is a system within Total War Warhammer that was extremely controversial when the game first came out. It's the concept that humans and dwarves and orcs and the undead couldn't live in certain areas. So the humans could live in the undead cities and the undead could live in the human cities, but the undead couldn't live in the mountain holds of the dwarves or the badlands of the orcs, and vice versa. The orcs could take over dwarven territories and the dwarves could take over orc territories, but they couldn't take over human territories. Now, Creative Assembly, when they first devised this system, gave the excuse that it was kind of around law and I think that was a bit of a weak excuse, but I can understand the reasons they did it. Creative Assembly realized this was a problem fairly early on, and it kicked up a bit of a fuss amongst the community, because a lot of people kind of wanted to paint the map, as it were, and sort of take over everything. In reality, in Warhammer, there are very few factions that actually want to kill everybody else and just take over the whole world. But I can understand that some players would want to do that with different factions. To their credit, CA kind of understood this as well, which is why they, sort of towards the back end of the development cycle, facilitated modding and made sure that on day one of the game, there was a mod whereby you could just conquer anywhere. Now, looking at the reasons why Creative Assembly decided to do this, as I said uh, earlier, their main reason was stated as being a law true reason. And this is to a certain is true because many of the factions don't want to commit genocide, but also it, the way they divided up the territories went against a lot of law in its own right. So I don't think that was necessarily the reason, but I think what CA were really trying to get at in the law was that, yes, these races do exist in the Warhammer world, they are not all trying to kill each other completely, some of them are, admittedly, but not all of them, and how do we show that in the Total War Warhammer game? And this was the system they came up with. And really, they came up with this system for two reasons. One was to kind of promote alliances. If you're the Empire, you need to al ally yourself with the Dwarves so that you can together rid the worlds of the forces of evil. And this idea of building alliances is kind of key to the Warhammer world as it stands. And that is an admirable thing to chase after. Not so that humans just take over everything and that's it. And I can see what they're going for. Another reason they approached it with the kind of 1v1 on humans versus undead and 1v1 orc versus dwarves was that it was simple. A lot of the creative and design decisions around Total War Warhammer were based around simplicity. We're bringing the Total War game down to its simplest element and to really encourage newcomers to Total War uh, who are maybe fans of Warhammer or for whatever reason, this was their stepping on point for the Total War series to pick up the game and be able to understand it and come to grips with it quite quickly. Now, for fans of the Total War franchise, this came as a bit of a disappointment. But again, it's one of those uh, design decisions that I can understand. And Warhammer, as many people might be annoyed, as simplified as it is to a Total War game in the franchise, Warhammer license itself did bring a lot of new people to the Total War franchise as a whole and uh, has been one of the best performing games they've had in a while, I believe. And another aspect I think they brought to the system was that at the time, Creative Assembly, I think, was slightly hedging their bets. They weren't sure how well the game would perform. They made the system quite simple. They weren't sure how many races they were going to add on top of the vanilla game. If it underperformed, they maybe wouldn't as make as much DLC as they perhaps planned. They didn't really know. So there's this kind of element of, okay, we need a system here so that everyone doesn't just kill everybody, but let's think of the simplest way we can do that, and this is what they came up with. Now, one might ask, why do I think this is going to change in Total War Warhammer 2, or the first expansion, or whatever you want to think about it as? Because for those who don't know, Total War Warhammer was just the first of a essentially a three-part game that was planned like this from the very beginning. It's not something they've just come up with. They've been working on it, or at least had the idea in the back of their heads all the time that Total War Warhammer 
was going to be a three-part game, and this is only the first part we got initially. So in part two, one of the reasons I think that regional occupation needs to change, and will change, if I'm honest, is the inclusion of the new races. In the second expansion, if the data leak is to believe, and for the most part is proven very accurate in terms of the plans that Creative Assembly have for the game, we are going to get the introduction of the Dark Elves, the High Elves, the Lizard Men, at some point in the near to long-term future of that second expansion we'll get the tomb kings and the skaven and most likely the ogre kingdoms as well and these new races bring a very sort of diverse set of sort of habitats and rules and the way their different species live and carry out their business as it were around the warhammer world and this presents ca with a number of different problems law wise and how they can seek to justify this with this one-on-one -on -one idea for regional occupation which once you bring in elves and lizard men, just seems nonsensical. All these factions are fighting each other. It's not humans versus undead and orcs versus dwarves. That's not what the game boils down to anymore. Even with the inclusion of things like the beast men and the wood elves, they've realized this and have made some changes. Another forceful argument to why we're going to see a change in regional occupation in Total War Warhammer 2 is what they've done with the wood elves, their latest DLC pack. Now, the wood elves aren't a horde and that could have been a lazy option they could have gone for but what they looked to do with the wood elves was to have large central cities that you'd have in the wood elves home territory of Athel Lauren and then satellite cities many of you know this many of you have played through the wood elves DLC now the idea of the satellite cities wasn't just to placate people who wanted to paint the map the idea of the satellite cities was to allow you to yes wood elves can live in different cities so we should allow them to do that but we also don't want you to go around necessarily conquering the entire map yourself. And this is why the cities that Wood Elves can take over tend to be rather weak and hard to defend. The concept being that you're actually maybe better off allowing allies to keep their city, trade with those allies, and with those allies fight against the forces of chaos, the forces of the undead, or whoever, whatever forces are going against you at any one time. And to a certain extent, that worked. It was a very successful model. But I don't think you can do this for everyone because you'd have just a lot of these odd, unpopulated satellite cities. Economies would be very sort of hard to balance. And although it is a fair enough system, it's not exactly quite true to the law either. Now, what this second iteration of the game or the first expansion, whatever you want to call it, would allow CA to do is to really look at the balance of the game. The Wood Elves was a solution to the game as it's balanced currently. But with a complete rehaul of the game systems with the introduction of new races, you can take a step back, look at the balance of the game, except that, yes, a lot of new people came to Total War with Total War Warhammer, but they now have a handle on the mechanics of Total War, and we can maybe increase the complexity a little bit. Now, I don't think we're going to go back to the most complex iteration of Total War we've ever had, but I think they can, they will li lift the level of complexity in terms of the systems that underlie the Total War Warhammer world, because they can now. They've done their introductory aspect to the game, and now people are getting to grips with it, and the newcomers to the series can adjust and learn to deal with more complex systems. The also introduction of new continents in terms of Nagarov, Ulfwan, and Lustria really do add different elements to, and different challenges that need to be met. Creative Assembly have recognized they have a problem, have taken steps to address the issue in terms of population control. Now, how can they do that in a way that sticks to the law and is true to the sort of idea, their game design idea, and lawfully true concept that they don't necessarily want these races who are all looking to commit genocide against one another. That's not the Warhammer world. That's not really what most of the races are about. So the Wood Elves aren't looking to just kill everything on the entire world. I'd even argue that Chaos aren't necessarily looking to kill the entire world, although Games Workshop argued against me on that one. So what can they do? Now, here's what I think they will do and what they can do in a equally relatively simple manner while still allowing that accessibility for newcomers or people who don't necessarily want the most complex systems underlying their Total War Warhammer game to be implemented. And that's through the aspect of population control. Now, I envisage in Total War Warhammer 2, population control should be the key aspect to determine how conquered territories are handled. For example, in Total War Warhammer as it stands now, you have different factors that can contribute towards population growth. And population growth allows you to expand your cities, build new buildings, really essentially just develop your whole infrastructure on the campaign map to gain new units, to build up your armies, all the good stuff. 
that is governed by population control and really is used currently as a way of them pacing the game and with a few tweaks this system could be used to really govern how you populate the world what territories you want to conquer, what territories are attractive to you, what territories aren't worth conquering and worth maybe saving for an ally or encouraging an ally to take. And I think it would be just a perfect solution to the regional occupation problem. So what would an example of this maybe look like? Well, I might, I'm going to go into it in a bit more detail later, but just to give you an idea of what, my, of what the concept is. So say uh, Empire player goes and conquers Karazakarak, whatever, Karak Kadrin, wherever you like, and they go in and they can take it. And now there's nothing in the law that stops humans living in Karaks. That's not, there's no reason for that whatsoever. Like, a human can just go and live in the Karak. Absolutely no objection, humans can live in Karaks. So they should be allowed to take over Dwarven territories. But to encourage this idea of alliances and to encourage this idea of not committing genocide on a world scale by killing all the Dwarves and taking over their territories, use population control. Make it very hard for Empire players to gain population. Make it take them, on average, if left to its own devices without agents or without necessarily like growth buildings or without growth bonuses, to take upwards of maybe, I don't know, even 50, 70 turns to fully upgrade a Karak. The law reasoning for this could be that humans just don't like living underground all the time. It's not pleasurable for them. It's not fun. Equally with the Badlands, humans don't want to live in a sort of barren desert that's just hard to scrounge a living off of. It's not their system. It's not their way of life. They don't necessarily want to do it. You'd be hard-pressed as an emperor to give someone a province in the Badlands and say, oh yeah, completely populate this region. And don't be scared to make it take a long time. Now, what this allows someone to do is, if you really want to take over a character for strategic reasons or for whatever reasons, you can do it. But it will take a ex lot of hard work and a lot of time for you to be able to defend, hold at bay, and develop that character to a point where it's an economically viable option for you to have. And this, I think, is the perfect solution to what Creative Assembly are looking for. If I take over a Karak and it takes me 70 turns or 100 turns or... Essentially, an element needs to be balanced, but a very long time to get my Karak fully developed to a level 5 city. Then I'll be less encouraged to take the Karak. I want to take the territories I can grow quickly, I can develop faster. Now, in order to do this, Creative Assembly need to establish an, an understanding of environmental territories. So what environments make for what civilizations? And this could be relatively simply done. My concept, which I'm thinking they could use, but it's not at all going to be this way, but I do think they will use population control as their method of control, or should. The Wood Elves thing is just too simple and not quite right law-wise and needs too much twerking, uh, not twerking, tweaking to make correct. So what would that look like? Well, here are the environments you'd maybe need to split it into. Now, these are just my thoughts. You guys might disagree. You guys might agree. Let me know in the comments. But essentially, you'd have human cities. Norska also subbing in for Norska and the Chaos Wastes. But the Chaos Wastes is a discussion I'll, I'll discuss as I sort of go through the different civilizations and how they'd react to this, these different environments. Mountain holds, elven cities, the Badlands and Desert. Because with the introduction of the Tomb Kings, we're going to get the desert. We're going to get maybe Araby, but I think that might be a bit beyond them. I think they're just going to give that whole territory to the Tomb Kings, if I'm honest. And then jungles or forests. These are kind of the categories I imagine that would be the simplest ways to break down the different kinds of territory within the Total War Warhammer world. Now let's start with the Empire. I used them in the example earlier, taking Karaks. So all you'd really need is maybe a three-tier system to be able to categorize what's the best for population growth for you. What cities can you develop the quickest? Now, tier one would be the quickest, and for me, for the Empire, that would be human cities, as they stand already, and elven cities. Elves and humans, not too dissimilar. Elves are a bit more hardy, I suppose, to some degree, but they could live in comparable places. Tier two, where the population takes a little bit longer to get to where it's going. To max out population, you really have to put in effort. You really have to work at it. You'd have the mountain holds of the dwarves, which aren't necessarily horrible places for humans to live, except you don't see a lot of sunlight, so maybe slightly discouraged from living there. Thusly, it slows down a bit. Next up on that same tier, maybe Norska. There are humans living there, but Norska, I imagine, the other contributing factor towards a Norskan environment or a chaos waste environment is that they'd be almost perpetually and escalating uprisings. That's what I'd like to see. Rebellions, chaos corruption just keeps causing rebellions 
and that's why it's maybe harder to take. But also it's a tier two, so it is less environmental and less hospitable than a human or an elven city for the empire. And the third tier, we're looking at jungles, we're looking at forests, we're looking at deserts, we're looking at the badlands. Just places where it's actually kind of hard for humans to develop a sort of huge significant culture without doing major environment, without having a major environmental impact and deforesting vast areas or building aqueducts and what have you, which is possible. But just as the areas as they stand, I think it should be very hard for humans to live in the badlands, very hard for humans to live in the deserts. Although, yes, there is this, there is the argument for Araby that could be made, but I still think it should be a slow growth place for humans nonetheless. Equally, Bretonia has the same issues, they're still humans, same tiers. That's what I'd like to see. Now, moving on, we have the dwarves. Now, the dwarves are slightly different. The dwarves love their characters, they love their mountain living, but something that always irked me about Total War Warhammer, the first iteration, is that dwarves don't like necessarily living in the Badlands. Yes, they do have Barak Var, I suppose, which is on Flatland, and dwarves are perfectly capable of living on in human cities. There are many dwarves who work in the gunnery school of Nullan. There are dwarves all over the empire that potter around and don't have a hard time living there. But again, dwarves in Warhammer, I don't believe, have the same kind of Dragon Age aversion to, like, the open sky. Could, tell me if I'm wrong on that one. I'm slightly curious. I, I don't believe, I've not really ever seen anything that says that. But the dwarves are even historically a mountain people, said to have evolved from sort of mountain living wild creatures or sort of a Neanderthal equivalent of a dwarf that lived in the caves in the mountains. They never really lived in the lowlands. So my argument being, yes, tier one, mountain holds. Always mountain, mountain holds. Tier two, human and elf cities. Quite comfortable to live in, but dwarves maybe seem to prefer the mountains. They like their gems and iron and stuff, so they maybe prefer the mountains. And then tier three for them, again, the jungles, the desert, Norska, the chaos wastes. But if there's a mountain hold in these, t in sort of Norska and the chaos wastes, then yeah, take the mountain, be happy about that. Again, maybe some public order issues, a lot of escalate uprises to get more and more difficult to deal with until eventually, almost inevitably, your city's overrun. That's how really the chaos wastes and Norska should work. But yeah, jungles and deserts, very hard for dwarves to live in. It's not their number one environment. Now moving on to maybe one of the races that do want to kind of kill everything and sweep everything aside, the undead. Now the undead, mainly necromancers who aren't the healthiest looking people to begin with. Yeah, undead everywhere. Now the way you do that is you do have to relook at the balance in the economy of the undead dead but there is no lawful reason why the undead should not be able to live in the mountains in the desert in the jungles anywhere and everywhere there should be undead but limit their economic buildings to the point where that can be sustainable and it's very hard and just make it very hard for the undead to ally with every, anyone so do encourage them just to go and take over the entirety of the map and make them a faction that can do that uh, some of the undead like the von Karsteins, are maybe looking to establish natural empire with some human living humans in it some undead are looking to just have an entire kingdom of the dead just depends on who the leader is in the faction, but on the whole, the undead should be able to live everywhere. I don't think there should be any population concerns, because the population is essentially just them using dark magic to raise zombies to do work in a city for them. It shouldn't be terribly hard. So the undead, I think, should be able to take over every territory, but just redesign their economic structures and their buildings to be able to accommodate that and not make them completely OP on the campaign. Moving on from Undead, we have Chaos. Now, Chaos is a horde in Total War Warhammer as it stands, and I think it will stay a horde until Total War Warhammer 3, where the Chaos factions are going to be divided into the factions of the four Chaos gods, but until that point, I just wanted to give you this map, because a lot of you might not realize that Chaos actually do have settlements and fortresses. Uh, this map is showing essentially the bottom half of this map is the northern edge of Norska, as you know it on the Total War Warhammer map. And this area is essentially an expanded map of the Chaos Waste as they stand. As you can see, there are a number of fortresses and citadels. And so for the Chaos Faction, I actually think the Wood Elf system would work perfectly. Give them their fortress, maybe even one fortress per faction. Give them that fortress and then let them go out essentially with either make it a horde that they go out in. So you still have horde structures where they can recruit and they can sort of travel north and travel south and just keep conquering because they can build troops within their own armies. And that's maybe a mix of a horde and a settlement, but they just have this one powerhouse base back at home, which maybe gives them bonuses to the campaign, the bonuses to the quality of their troops, whatever you want to make it. But I want to see Fortresses of Chaos up in the north at some point in the future. 
Now, you could, rather than make them a, have horde armies, which I think would be an interesting concept of a city and a horde army, you could make them have the Wood Elf satellite thing. But I actually think the Wood Elf system as it stands currently is actually a really good fit for Chaos. And maybe make them just build Chaos shrines on the buildings, they, on the littler settlements, if you decide to go exactly the Wood Elf way, rather than make them a mixed horde settlement faction. So Chaos, I think, would work be beautifully with that system. Next up, we have the Greenskins. Now, the Greenskins, for those of you who don't know, and this may be different from other a fancy law in the Warhammer universe are essentially a plant fungus. They can kind of pop up anywhere. They're a very hardy creature and it's very hard to get rid of them. So as I said, with the undead and the greenskins, although not necessarily looking to kill everyone, they're always looking for a fight. And although if everyone was dead, they'd probably be a bit miffed because there was no one left to bash. But in their stupidity, they might kill everyone and then just not realize they'll miss everyone until they've already killed them. So again, with the undead, this is a faction that should rampage everywhere and anywhere, live in human cities, not live in human cities, and these guys should be everywhere. Just cover every single territory. Now, actually what I'd like to see is a mix of greenskin factions. I'd like to see greenskin factions that do settle. So a greenskin faction that can conquer cities and does settle like that. But I also wouldn't mind seeing a couple of horde greenskin factions. Like it was suggested in my comments, I think, by one of my uh, subscribers that the greenskins like Azag could be a horde faction for the greenskins. You'd have a very different campaign with Azag if you made him that, and I think that would be really interesting. So Azag would be a horde faction, whereas Grimgore's faction could maybe settle down and build cities and build a infrastructure that way around constructing their armies. But mix it up with the greenskins. There's enough greenskin heroes to really do whatever you want with them. Make them hordes. Make a settlement faction. Let them play in different ways throughout the campaign. Give us a bit more choice as the player. But that's my thinking on the greenskins for Total War Warhammer 2. Now we're looking at the High Elves. Now these are going to be added in the next iteration. And the High Elves are sort of one of the reasons with the new races why you need to implement a new system. Again, High Elves, very similar to the humans in terms of their what they like, where they like to live. Uh, so you've got that, you've got the mountains, you've got Norska, and you've got the jungles and deserts. Now, a problem that the High Elves present Creative Assembly, which is one of the reasons I decided to make this video and it actually got me thinking, was that the High Elves have Elven cities, and Elven cities stretch as far as Nagaroth, and you could argue that in, in terms of environment, Nagaroth is as harsh an environment as Norska, but for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of CA's simplicity and what I think, whether I think they're willing to go the extra mile by making the Dark Elf, uh, Nagaroth area, a different environmental thing. I say they probably wouldn't. So I just decided to put them all in Elven cities in one go. But I could see the argument being making for Nagaroth being a completely different kind of environment. But I see Nagaroth kind of like the Empire's Kislev, where it's not the most hospitable. And to make, and to ask CA to draw that degree of distinction uh, in terms of population growth and population control is maybe asking a bit too much. So I just see them plunking them all in as human cities and elf cities and make them just interchangeable, really, for, for either race. Now, population control for the elves might be a bit more difficult. Maybe they'd have slow population growth to begin with. That would be quite an interesting aspect to add to their civilization. They build, like, the best stuff. Some of their upgrades are the most fantastic, but it takes them ages to get anything built or for their cities to grow, simply because there are so few elves left. I think that might be an interesting mechanic for their civilization. But that's more of a wait-and-see thing rather than my concept for regional occupation. So as you can see, with the jungles and the deserts being the least hospitable to them as well. Moving on, Dark Elves, exactly the same thing. You guys get the idea with the elves and my thinking. And then we have the Lizard Men. Now, the Lizard Men, obviously, jungles and forests, they wouldn't mind. Now, I wasn't sure about the deserts here. I think human and elven cities, they could take over fine. You can have the the um the lizard men there living you can have the lizard men living in human and elf cities okay. Now one of the problems the lizard men have in terms of population control is there's actually a good law reason that population control might be irrelevant to them or particularly strict with them. And that's this like, concept of the spawning pools and the and the gods to the uh, lizard men are the old ones. And the idea being that the old ones could see the future. So whenever new lizard men are born, they're born for a particular purpose at a particular time to placate the great plan. So in terms of law, the population idea might have a bit of trouble with the lizard men, but honestly, if they did it so that dwarves can live in the badlands and humans can't live in Karax and the undead can only live in human cities, then I don't see them delving too deep in terms of the lizard men law and how their population system kind of runs. So the third tier for the lizard men would be the mountains and uh, Norska. 
I'd see them doing, ba they're cold-blooded, I see them doing badly in the cold. That was my concept here. Tier 2, human elf cities in the desert. Now, the desert would be quite harsh, harsh on some of them, because they are, some of them are kind of amphibious-like. But I figured if you have a settlement near enough a river, and a lot of the badland settlements and stuff like that tend to be near bodies of water, you could do it. Maybe give them extra attrition in the desert, or something like that, for the lizard men to show that aspect, because they do need some humidity. But I figured, yeah, give them forests, because you're not going to get jungles all over the world, but you do get forests all over the shop. And uh, yeah, so that's my kind of thinking for the lizard men. And next we have the tomb kings, and you might not be surprised, but the tomb kings, like the vampire counts, should be able to go everywhere. They're undead. They're undead with monsters that look great and look like living statues. Living statue doesn't care if it's cold. Living statue doesn't care if it's wet. Living statue doesn't care if it's dry. Living statue can go underwater. Whatever. Tomb kings go everywhere. Let them do that. And that about sums it up for my Total War Warhammer 2 Reasonable Occupation video. I really just wanted to start a conversation with you guys and let me know what you think of that as a concept. What you maybe think they'll do to fix the regional occupation problem in Total War. It's one of the major like problems I had with the game when it first came out. I have since learned to live with it, but with the new races coming in, you can see there's going to be an upcoming problem. They can't do this two-on-two prop like this two on two civilization taking over thing it's just dumb it doesn't work so have it dictated by population control those are at least my thoughts on it i hope you guys found this video interesting and i hope it will open up a debate uh, in the comments below in terms of what you guys think they should do for regional occupation but i really hope to see population control as the major factor in regional occupation in total war warhammer 2 and yeah let's maybe hassle creative assembly about it and get it get it seen if they haven't planned it already and to be fair with their thinking and the way they designed the wood elves i i would be very surprised if they don't address regional occupation in a way that is based upon population in the next iteration of the game because you can see it's something they're thinking about with the inclusion of the wood elf faction anyway guys i hope you found that video interesting look forward to uh joining you on the next one uh if you did like it please do drop a like it really helps the channel out helps the channel grow for more videos on total war warhammer 2 speculation on the lore of total warhammer on other strategy and role-playing games please do subscribe to the channel and uh, look forward to seeing you soon thanks very much and uh, have a great day